Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer. I am the Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. And today, we are going to take a look at some of the challenges enterprise teams face when it comes to managing cloud costs. And I'm laughing because I think that's a topic that's on everybody's minds these days. In addition to that, we're going to talk about the challenges of managing Kubernetes complexity and boosting developer productivity. I'm joined today by Rafe, CEO and founder, Hasib Boudani, and we're gonna explore some findings from Rafay's recent survey, the trend toward platformization that we're seeing in the industry and the role that platform teams are poised to play in helping eliminate these cost complexity and productivity challenges. Welcome, Hasib. I'm so glad to have you. Shelly, thank you for having me. Good to see you. Absolutely, absolutely. So platform engineering teams have no small responsibility. I'm sure that you won't argue with that. They play an outsized role in driving digital transformation initiatives and, of course, their influence on decisions as it relates to cloud infrastructure, Kubernetes, and AI tech is considerable. But there are a ton of challenges and complexities here that require strategies and tools that optimize resources and that help standardize processes and, of course, foster innovation, which is all the things we want. And that's, of course, part of what we're going to be talking about today. Rafe recently re released results of a research study exploring the critical role that platform teams in modern enterprise tech environments um, are dealing with. And this study was done in two parts. One part of the research study, let's see, surveyed about 1,050 US-based respondents to explore the current and future trends and challenges associated with Kubernetes and Kubernetes automation. The second part of the research study involved 1,035 US-based respondents sharing thoughts on Gen AI and AI trends and challenges. So we've got kind of a, a double bang for the buck here. And so that was no small undertaking, um, Hasib, to do two of these studies concurrently. And I can't wait to really dive into the results because I think you had some fascinating findings. So I wanna talk first about Kubernetes and cloud environment management. Your report showed that nine in 10 organizations surveyed reported that platform teams, their platform teams face persistent and considerable challenges. That comes as zero surprise to me, and I'm sure it wasn't any surprise to see that on your end either. I'd love it if you would walk me through some of the challenges, though, that, that um, the survey respondents identified that they're facing. Yeah, happy to do that. And I would say that given how many years now we've all been going to KubeCon, uh, <laughs> still hearing people say, well, nine out of 10 people say that it's the, you know, it's a persistent challenge is, uh, well, selfishly it's great, right? We can, we can, we get to make money, but, but I think practically speaking, right, that, that speaks to our industry as a whole, right? I mean, this is a complex technology and uh, uh, many of our customers uh, first choose to invest time in building tooling themselves and it becomes a, a, a a monster which costs a lot of money right. uh, and all of our customers like the first thing that they want to talk about particularly when it comes to cloud native technologies is how do i reduce my costs my cloud cost my people costs right my, the time it takes for me to take new applications to market and that's where i think you know, the, the the biggest takeaway is for me um so the the report showed that you know uh, just the fact that uh so many organizations so 45 percent of the organizations say that they don't have enough visibility into what is this cost right now? what am i spending on this which team is using what so half right which is which is a very large number visibility is sort of the first step in the right direction towards uh having a an efficient implementation of platform engineering but if you don't have the visibility obviously it's challenging and yes of course we provide these capabilities to solve the problems but i think the the meta point here is that yeah i mean you know this many years later uh, you know, in the majority cycle of Kubernetes, half the, the respondents, and this is not a sample size of 10 people, right? This is a thousand people. Right. So it's a very representative sample size. Right. It, uh, half, half of them say they don't have visibility into these uh, into these environments. And about, I think the number is like 38%, so about, you know, four out of 10, uh, people still talk about cluster lifecycle management. And I got to tell you, Shelly, that when we first engage with our customers or our prospective customers, 100% of the time they say, we already have provisioning working. This is not what I want to focus on right now. I want to focus on reducing the cost of all of this stuff. 
and they spend time talking about standardization, which is where we start our, our journey with our customer base. Right. And that fundamentally helps them reduce the sort of the, the, the outliers, right? I mean, the snowflake situations in an enterprise, which is where you end up wasting a lot of money. And that sure. brings their cost down. And then they get, say, okay, all right, now let's go back to the original problem, which was lifecycle management of Kubernetes. And in the report, four out of 10 people said that in itself is a, is a challenge. So, you know, 40, 50% of uh, the customer base is still struggling with, I would say, foundational problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is, uh, uh, I mean, you know, our, our audience will, will conclude what it means. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed by that. Right? I thought we were farther along than we are, I guess. In this in this industry i have to say that i'm not really surprised by that but i feel like you know so many of the things that you've hit on here are just part of a recurring theme and you know there was a time when you know move to the cloud move to the cloud it's going to be amazing it's going to be you know solve all your problems take everything off prem you know and then people started getting hit by these massive cloud costs. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that we're dealing with in here too. And, you know, I, I know that I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but we're dealing with, you know, IT teams and a dearth of highly skilled tech talent. And we're dealing with, in some ways, what I think is somewhat of an outdated um, strategy. And you, you addressed this early on in terms of, you know, sometimes the mindset is let's build it ourselves. We can do it ourselves. The reality of it is in most instances, not only should you not do it yourself in terms of the time and the cost and everything else. I mean, the beauty of working with a trusted vendor partner in, in this kind of situation is that you're working with somebody who who solved the same problems that you are experiencing or who will at you will experience and they're able to bring all of that knowledge and expertise to the table for you and and shorten your time to value so i think that that's that's an important part of this equation too but i think the last thing is just the complexity issue i mean there's so much happening right now and i and i can see you know, your comment about when you have this conversation with IT teams and, and their responses, we don't want to think about that right now. We want to focus on whatever else it is. But the reality of it is, I've spent a career as a strategist and you have to step back from these situations and look at things, in my opinion, from a 30,000 foot view and really make sure that you have a plan and a strategy that makes sense. And, and there's no part of that that can be successful in my opinion, if you don't have visibility, you know, how can you, how can you know what you're doing if you can't see what's happening? You know, I think maybe yep. these things have crossed your mind. Indeed. Yeah. How will you know where you're going? If, uh, you know, if you don't know where how to get there. Yeah. So, so if, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with where I start to start the, uh, the, the response to what you said, but, but I would say that, um, two, three years ago, cost is not where our customers were, uh, sort of starting their conversations. Right. And I keep thinking, is it a, is it a market issue? Is it in the economy? Is it the economy that's causing, causing this? Or is it that I've been doing this for such a long time that I'm looking for efficiencies? Maybe well, I think maybe, problem. I think maybe both, yeah. but, but you yeah. know what else is that? I think we have to factor in it's 2024. Okay. And so we're two years out of a global pandemic, right? And in 2020 to 2022, what we had to do was sort of throw away all of the business norms that we were accustomed to. And we had to embrace sort of digital transformation on steroids and things we didn't budget for yet, or we didn't really think we had the time or the bandwidth to do yet. A lot of those things we had to put in motion, right? And so then, you know, we have to navigate that two-year period. Then you come out of the two-year period. And that's where we are right now is in that two years post-COVID. And so I think there's a bunch of factors here that speak to why people maybe aren't further along in this. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's quite quite possible and quite likely. I mean, you just said something that I'd never thought about before, which is the sort of the perfect balance of two years of COVID and two years of this economy. Right. And maybe maybe what that argues is that 2025 is going to be a better year. Of, uh, uh, we'll see. I, I hope you're right. Let's hope. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's look, I mean, this complexity is not going to go away. It's not a money right. issue, right? At the end of the day, we've seen our customers spend a lot of money on some of the stuff. They've been massive organizations and have not made progress. And, and you said something before about uh, sort of where do you start this conversation? You talked about how if you don't have visibility, then how will you know? Right. Um, I would I would say that 
if you haven't really stepped back and architected what you're really trying to do, it's not going to work out. It's so, not. So yeah, many times we'll have customers come and say things like, well, what I'm really looking for is this one thing, right? Do you, do you do this? Maybe, I don't know, right? The real question is not that, right? The question is, okay, let's take a step back. We are trying to solve for? Who are your end customers, actual customers, right? You are selling to some people, some developers, some, some data scientists. What do they need? What is the perfect experience for them? Let's just write that down first. And now let's work backwards from that experience to say, what is the tooling that is, needs to be in place uh, to make them successful? And then who are the people and what's the right automation? And yes, eventually we'll talk about all the cool technologies that Rafi has to offer. Right. And okay. I'll tell you that the core, the, I don't know if this is correlation causation. I think it's causation, but we'll see. Uh, the, every time the conversation starts at the architecture level, 12 months later, that customer is incredibly successful. Yeah. And what yeah. I just said to you, I tell everybody this. And I say, look, I'm telling you, I've done this enough times. Take a step back. And the ones who don't, because whatever reason, right, whatever pressures they have, a year later, the project's a mess, right? So yeah. it's, a, it's, it's usually kind of disbanded, right? And that's what I tell everybody. Just let's take a pause, right? We take another week and we talk versus jump into, hey, do you have that one? Can you, can you do backups? Oh yes, we, yes, but of course. why are we talking about this? Let's not talk. Yes, right? yeah. absolutely. Point, right? Obviously, I'm, I'm coming up with a with a simplistic example, but this happens consistently. And the ones who think about the architecture, ma'am, you know what the most important thing is? Because of the the efficiencies are embedded in the architecture. Yeah, yeah. And well, and you know, deeper. in the conversations that I have on this topic, I mean, this is really pretty simple. And I'm going to use a simple analogy. I mean, this is like building a house, and when you build a house. You start with a foundation, right? And uh, building, you know, starting with a strong foundation, that's your architecture and, you know, following the plan that you make um, as part of building this foundation and that architecture. I think that's really, that's really important. And so, so solid points there, solid points. Well, let's talk a little bit if we can about some challenges. And I know that your survey respondents had no shortage of challenges that they face and that they shared. And when it comes to keeping up with complex Kubernetes cluster life cycles and cloud environments, I think complexity is probably the word of the of the year. So talk with me a little bit about those challenges and, and what your customers are seeing and how that's impacting them and just kind of what you're seeing out there. Yeah, I think on the large enterprise, mid to large enterprise side, I would say that the, the most interesting requirement uh, Interesting in that it just makes sense when you when you when you think about it, right? They they all had data centers or polos and they had applications running there, and then they moved to the cloud. Yes, they may have been cloud first, but they still have applications running in a data center. And particularly now with AI, many enterprises we talk to, they're finding that the cloud is incredibly expensive, particularly when it comes to these high-end NVIDIA GPUs. I already have a colo. Let me go buy some servers. Now yeah. I have some stuff in the cloud, some more traditional applications in, in a data center, some cloud native applications in a data center, and now have Gen I, Gen AI stuff going on, or at least some, some GPU gear, if you yeah. like, because most people are early in their data center. Okay, what's the experience I want to deliver to my customer? So going back to the same architecture conversation, right. as a developer, I, I, I say this loosely, but I just want to press a button, right? Just want to press a button and just stuff should happen. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to wait. I don't want to talk to some guy. I don't want to explain this to get, <laughs> Press the button. Same. Right? I want it to so, be easy, intuitive, yeah. require no effort, little effort on my part. I don't want to have to think about it. I want to know yeah. that you've thought about it. Exactly, right? Yeah. And uh, this notion of guardrails, they shouldn't really exist, right? These It's like children, right? You know, seen, not not, not heard. Uh, I always start my, like, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm meeting with a C-level person in a large enterprise, uh, I do a demo where I show them an energy experience. Here's a developer. AI, they want a GPU and they go press a button and they say, I want a GPU. And then it says, okay, well, how many do you need? And it says, well, uh, I guess any one. Well, actually, you're not allowed to have one. You can only have a seven. Or actually, I know your team, you probably need eight. And then they yeah. press a button and magic happens. And then I tell them, tell me where this is running right now. What do you think? And 100% of the time, people say it's probably Amazon or then say, no, maybe it's Google. No, it's a data center. Right. Same exact experience. Private cloud, true elastic experience. It can be done anywhere. Yeah. And that's what 
most of our customers think about. The survey uh, talked about this as well. A third of the population we surveyed, their number one requirement, that doesn't mean others didn't have this, but the number one thought on their minds was, how do I make the public cloud, private cloud experience sort of well look the same, right? Because at the end of the day, it's a cloud. Yeah, happens to be in Equinix, so what? What, are you going to tell me that oh, for developers, I'm not going to go to Equinix because the icon developed experience? No, no, no. That That's, if you step back and think about architecture, if you think about the right experience, then you marry that with the notion of, well, if I run some things in Amazon because they're truly burst, you know, the burst of lots of, makes sense, but these other things are pretty stable. GPUs are not a, an elastic commodity anyway. Even if you go to Amazon, you're going to do a three-year deal. Might as well do this in a data center. A lot of people right. are doing this right. Okay. If you think about these things the right way, then you can actually have the right experience for both public and private, but your developers won't even know the difference. Right. Right. And that's what number one thought for the people we talk. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a no brainer, right? I mean, that makes everybody's work less of a heavy lift and, and everybody's path easier. So I totally get that. Well, and you know, one of the things that I think is interesting, it's not that Kubernetes and cloud complexities aren't already enough to be wrangling, but now we've got AI and Gen AI in the mix. Actually, you know, AI isn't new in any way. We've been using AI for a very long time, um, but we've got Gen AI that's added into the mix. And, you know, of course those are, AI and Gen AI are top of mind for everyone these days. I'd love to dig in a little bit further about how you see AI and Gen AI initiatives complicating platforms, teams work in the enterprise and, and really maybe discuss some of the challenges that they face that might be different. Oh, I can give you an example from literally this morning, ma'am. Uh, so we have an existing customer who's been using our product in public cloud for a while. Uh, they had a data science team who's been doing data science stuff for a long time. Now, this is not a new concept for this company. If I were to tell you the name of the company would go, oh, of course it makes sense. But so they've had a data science team for a while. Well, here's what happened. The data science team was solving one specific problem. Now there's a mandate that we're going to apply Gen AI, right? Not just traditional ML, but Gen AI to a number of uh, systems in the company. Mm -hmm. So now there's a bunch of developers who are actually not data scientists who are now playing with all these tools. And the, the CTO in this organization, who, who is our customer, uh, he went to his platform engineering leadership and he said, I want you guys to own this now. Before they didn't. Now they do. So now they're like, okay, <laughs> where, where would you go from here? So the first call they made was to Rafael. And it's like, okay, well, are you guys doing in this space? Any, anything at all in the space that you're working on? So we walked <laughs> them through our perspective on uh, AI, you know, traditional AI as well as Gen AI, because it's, you know, look, end of the day, here's my very simplistic way of thinking about this, right? The only real difference between AI and Gen AI is that the models are larger for Gen AI. Yeah. The, the rest of the stuff is, is going to end up being the same. So identifying the model, tuning the model, all that stuff, absolutely, that's that's additive for Gen AI. But the rest of the pipeline is actually exactly the same. You got to still yeah. take it to production with the same guardrails. And what we told this guy, and this is what we tell everybody is, you got to think about this as two different problem sets. There's an AI pipeline problem. Let's call it an AI platform. And then you have a Gen AI playground problem. You got to try these things out. You don't know which one's going to work for which part of the business. So you, but you got to be able to enable both. So, hey, now that you own the data science platform, uh, congratulations, we're going to help you, well, <laughs> take over that so you can make the life of the data scientist better. And here's why the yeah. data scientists want to agree. Today, they do it themselves. Right. So half their time is spent figuring out platform stuff. Now you're going to go to them and say, I'm going to give this to you as a service. You get half your time back. They're going to love that. You're the hero. Do that. Right. Oh, absolutely. 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 Well, and I know that your survey respondents talked about this and said that, you know, it's they felt that it was super important for organizations to provide efficient methods for AI and Gen AI um, app development and deployment, but that most organizations share their developers find it challenging to experiment with and deploy AI and Gen AI apps. And so making that, you know, you said that you mentioned the playground and, you know, really allowing people to get in easy access to experiment, to play, 
um, you know, to discover. I think that's part of the key to success here. And like you said, you know, kind of giving ownership of that to certain teams within organizations, I think is a bit of a game changer. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement that maybe is, a is, is not the majority opinion right now, but, you know, platforms like Bedrock and SageMaker that are very, very good. These are Amazon AWS right. tools. Uh, they are so expensive that doesn't matter how many guardrails the public clouds put on them. I think the customer base is trying to figure out a way where they can have tools that can run in any cloud or in a data center. So of course you can't take SageMaker anywhere else. And the reason why people are doing that is, well, they want to reduce cost. They want to keep the experience exactly the same, doesn't matter where they run it. And more so, they want to be able to apply their own uh, guardrails. For example, uh, Shelly, you can experiment every day with 100 tokens. I don't care where you go, but only 100 tokens. So how yeah. do you do that? Right. So these kinds of requirements are coming our way that frankly are new to us, right? Six months ago, we had not really spent time thinking about this stuff. Right. Um, and we are now, so in the playground that we, we are implementing, uh, you know, we're thinking about how do you apply these sort of enterprise-wide policies, team level, user level, et cetera, so that you can keep cost low, but at the same time, you can you can enable developers to go to a, some system where they have pre uh, uh, sort of selected models that they can play with, et cetera, et cetera, because some models are expensive and some models are free. So these are decisions that we believe that the platform engineering team and the leadership in an organization is going to make based on business reasons, and that the data science will be given, you know, a set of vector DBs, a set of uh, models, and 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 the pipelines, and then they will be asked to take it from here. And everybody's going to be watching. What is my token budget? Every because this can, if you don't watch this, I mean, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars in a week if you don't really pay attention to this. And nobody wants that. Nobody yeah. wants that at all. Well, and I think that's really goes to the heart of why platform teams are so crucial. And and I am sure that we're on the same page here. I mean, it's obviously they, they play and they will continue to play a pivotal role in helping teams overcome these challenges and, and really help speed us on the path to getting to what everybody wants, which is some bottom line ROI on some of these efforts, you know? Indeed. Yeah, Indeed. absolutely. So addressing some of the challenges that we've talked about it's it's clear that getting arms around cost management and automation and developer productivity are squarely in the sights of IT leaders talk with me a little bit about how your survey respondents indicate what they're going to do moving forward to address these challenges do you have any intel from them on that front yeah so i would say like the the big like if I were to summarize everything in one word, I would say it's automation. Yeah. Because uh, automation leads to standardization. Standardization leads to uh, uh, standardization leads to centralization. And centralization is the right thing to do for most of these companies. Uh, but automation is the first step in that direction. And uh, uh, the survey shows, and th this is what I find uh, fascinating about the survey. We spent a lot of time trying to make it completely unbiased, right? So there are questions in here that sure. have, frankly nothing to do with Rafe. But the answers are very consistent, right? What is the most important thing to people? I don't want people to build their own clusters. I want to automate cluster provisioning. Okay, well, love that, right? I want to standardize infrastructure consumption. So landing zones, for example, I want to be able to press a button and they should all look the same. Press a button 50,000 times, it should well, be the same exact stuff, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the second one, right? Or I want to do self-service consumption of compute. So that number, was, so it was 44%. Uh, that was an interesting number. Um, I'm hopeful that that number is going to trend higher over time, because I think once you have the right controls, the right standardization in place, then you've taken care of uh, any outliers. And once you have done that, there's no reason why you should enable, you should not enable more self-service consumption. So every account we talk to, we 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 set a kind of a far out goal for the customer as part of our customer success or kind of onboarding. Eventually, we would love for you, Mr. Customer, to allow any, uh, users to do self-service consumption. Some say yes, some say no. And that is also reflected, right? 44% said, I want to do this, which means 56% said that I want to do this. Right. Uh, and then the rest are you know, things that I'm, I, I mean, you would expect uh, to be there, right? I, I want to reduce cognitive load on developers, et cetera. But even the cognitive load piece, the, the reason why this cognitive load is because the platform implementations are, are have gaps. 
right? Your automation is lacking, or you are putting a bunch of burden on the data scientists who you never supported before. Now you have to, it's, for example. And once that cognitive load goes away, a people have more time to spend working on the things that they, they should be working on when they get paid mm -hmm. for. And be they're happier. Like more so, I think I think this is this is what I, what I find right when developers. I, I'm I'm one such person. If I have to spend time getting in my my laptop environment ready to write a new piece of code, that's like the thing I hate. I, I just Absolutely. I don't want to do this. Right, you do this for me. I just <laughs> want to write code. Right, and this is not how it is in companies. And automation enables you to get the developer to that point where they can focus on the thing that they love, which yeah. is right. Well, and that I mean that has such a huge impact throughout the company when you know when I'm a developer and I, I don't have to focus on all the minutia that I don't really want to do and that isn't the best use of my time and I can instead focus on innovating and speeding um, you know path to demonstrative ROI and things like that like those are the things that make me want to get up in the morning you know and so I think that you know one of the things that just shown through so clearly to me in in the survey that you did is just that the developer experience is everything and you know platform t tools and tooling that enhances that developer experience is amazing I know that you know you mentioned a couple data points already but I think something like 83% of respondents to your survey indicated they believe that pre-configured AI workspaces with built-in ML ops and LLM ops tooling could save their teams over 10% of time monthly, right? So make it easy, build it in. <laughs> you know, again, this goes with, to me, the benefit of working with a trusted vendor partner and, and don't believe that you have to, don't feel like you have to build everything from scratch because that's just going to put you behind the eight ball a little bit. And, you know, some of the other respondents in terms of their priorities platform teams mentioned in the report were things like, you know, 47% um, are interested in automation of cluster provisioning and, you know, to your uh, automation plays such a big role here, you know, standardizing and automating infrastructure, 44%. You mentioned that earlier. Providing self-service experiences for developers, another 44% who are interested in that. Automating Kubernetes cluster lifecycle management day two, 44%. There's a lot of 44s in there. <laughs> and then that reducing the cognitive lead. So there's, you know, it, it, developers are telling us what they want and need. And, and so solving for that, I think, helps everybody. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. And the 40s, I'm sure if this survey was run four years ago, this would have been in the tens and te uh, teens and twenties, right? Because oh, these yeah. numbers are they are getting larger and larger because the 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 recognition is is sort of uh, more universal now than it used to be around yeah. the need of, of automation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So talk with me a little bit, if you would, about what's ahead. Like, you know, you your research identified the the top platform team infrastructure priorities for the coming year. Um, tell me what those key priorities are in your mind. What what st stood out the most? Well, look, I mean, three out of five people, sixty percent said, "I just I want to reduce the cost associated with all this stuff." And we, right. we as a as as a, as a company, we spend a lot of time thinking about like how do you how do you enable multi tenant consumption of infrastructure? How do you do better chargebacks? How do you do resizing of applications uh, uh, proactively, et cetera? All, all to the same goal, which is I want to save money. Right. Um, that is consistent. And and when I do that, uh, I also want to be able to charge back. Right? So it's it's really it's fascinating to see uh, the, the top uh, outcomes being around cost, right? So I want to do, I, I, I should have easy chargeback capabilities. Right. Um, I should have clear visibility for the developer. Here's one that I actually was surprised by. So 58% uh, of, of the respondents said that I want to show the usage to the developer so they get a sense for how much they're costing this. Oh, company. absolutely. Fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of like, you know, I'm thinking about an analogy there. It's like if somebody puts you in a car and says, here, go drive here and do this or whatever, but you have no idea how much fuel you had when you started, how much fuel you've used on this journey. Should you have gone a different path because that might've saved fuel? You know what I'm saying? I mean, like we can't manage what we can't see. Yep. Yeah. And not just the platform team people, right? Yep. So, and these yep. numbers were surprising, right? So, you know, 60% said, of course, we got to reduce costs of so three out of five, 47%, so almost half the people said that we need better chargeback uh, support in our, in our world. And then, 
yeah, I want to I want to show this to my developers, and that's uh, what is yeah. like fifty eight percent. So these are large numbers of uh, of of respondents who are uh, agreeing with the perspective that you and I started yeah. with. Yeah, I like it. I like it. You know, some other things that jumped out at me from the the research studies is that um, some other priorities were reliability and availability of applications. I mean, fifty eight percent of survey respondents indicated that that was important to them. And to your observability point, app and infrastructure observability and monitoring, 54% indicated that was a priority for them. Multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environment provisioning and management, 54%, that's a priority for them. So I think that I think that, that, that our respondents have spoken. They're telling us exactly what they want. Indeed. Yeah, uh, and uh, the, the good news is, by the way, the, the respondents are, are are a mix of developers and platform engineers, which means the sort of the more traditional IT function is also recognizing the same thing, which is good good for all of yeah, us. Absolutely. So I think that it's safe to say that the challenges that are faced by platform teams, from tool integration to multi cloud management cost management, all of these things highlight the need for robust, versatile tooling. Um, we know that self-service capabilities are important and, and something that people view as a key solution um, and, and also you know, offer the potential to boost developer productivity while allow, allowing that organizational cost control. So as we wrap this episode, Talk with me if you would leave our audience with your best advice after listening to this conversation or watching this conversation. How should they think about the path ahead when they, when they want to get arms around this within their organization? How do they think about this moving ahead? I'd say that. So I, I think the the most important thing is that uh, the platform engineering teams are are driving all of these decisions uh, in a in a very positive way, right? So they're really thinking about. What is the right thing for my business? And they, they seem to be empowered now to, to make these decisions for the business, which is excellent. Yeah. Uh, which is a, like, I mean, a, a bunch of us in this, in this community have been pushing this notion of platform engineering for a few years now. Seems like it is, it is a thing uh, in every, every company, whether they call it platform engineering, sometimes they call it other things, but the platform function is, is very much a thing now in all these organizations. I think uh, the question is, are they going to be successful? And one, requirement for success for platform engineering is going to be around the decisions they made around uh, architecture strategy tooling, right? So if in that order, uh, I would say, uh, so if they start with the tooling, that's a challenge, and right? then, then you're going to talk about tooling and who yeah. knows. But it's really about the right approach to solving the problem. Step back, think about what your business needs, what's your strategy to success, what are the tools that make sense? Uh, and, and there's a word that we haven't used here, but every platform engineering team thinks about commonalities, right? What are the things that all of my, uh, my, my customers need and how do I serve them all in a, in a way where I can reduce costs for the company, right? right? And this is where I think success is going to be built for these teams. If they do this well, if they architect that well, if they have the right strategy in mind, if they pick the right tool sets that apply across the board, across the enterprise, yeah. they're going to be very successful. Yeah, no, I think to me, it just all comes down to what can we do to empower our teams to be adaptable and to bring their expertise to the fore and then provide them with the ability to implement standardized, efficient processes across domains and all of those things help get us to where it is we want to be, which is, you know, being able to be effective, being able to be competitive, being able to innovate, all those sorts of things. And, and the platform teams play a big role there. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Haseeb Boudani, CEO and founder of Rafe, for a fantastic discussion on what's ahead for on the platformization front. It's clear that change needs to happen, and it, it is happening. And with players like Rafe in the mix, it's no doubt happening soon for the organizations that understand how important that shift is. Um, for our viewers and listeners, I will link... Uh, copies of the of the research studies in the show notes so that you can dive in and take a deeper look at those. But for our viewing and listening audience, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Shelly Kramer of The Cube Research, your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. And thank you so much, Haseeb Boudani, CEO of Rafe, for joining me today. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, thank you, Shelly. I really enjoyed it. I look forward to speaking again soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you can plan on it.